Can you please come and sit down? We're going to start. Good morning, everyone. Please sit down so we can start. I'd like to introduce the first speaker. Seems like this, we need a few more people to come. 
<laughs> okay. So I'd like to, um, hi, I'm Martine Fisser um, from the South African EFD Center. I'd like to, um, in 2007, 2008, on a wonderful little island off the coast of Sweden, and it was absolutely blissful. Uh, and it's just amazing to see how he's developed this idea and, and, and created an amazing unit. He's also the director of CESAR, the Center for um, the Studies of Collective Action. Um, Sarker has been amazing with, with building this group, um, drawing huge amounts of funding, publishing in, in journals like Nature Sustainability, Sustainability, Ambio, um, Social Science Quarterly. I, I mean, your jaw will just drop. I, I, I looked at, at his publications and I'm like, he's published in the last year as much as most people publish in 10 years. So it's very impressive and we look forward to hearing more about what he's doing right now. Thank you for a fantastic introduction. Now oh, I'm so embarrassed that I can't talk. Um, yes, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for coming and listening on the, in this early hour. Um, I, I will start by briefly just introducing the center, CCAR, Center for Collective Action Research. Because in the end of this presentation, I want you to be aware of this center. Uh, so we were developed four years ago with funding from the University of Gothenburg. And since then, we have added additional funding. So uh, today, we are a, a pretty good bunch of people from various disciplines uh, doing research on collective action, uh, and in particular, large-scale collective action. So, sort of what we do is basically to see how much of the Ostrom literature is traveling when we scale up to larger scale problems and what is required to generate collective action on those levels. Uh, and by now we have like eight, nine PhD students, some postdocs, quite a large number of senior researchers and PIs. And uh, uh, what we have in common uh, is the, uh, a joint point of departure in social dilemma theory, uh, which you are all familiar with. Um, and uh, we both do, I mean, some, at least the economists, some of the economists in, in the center, they do more uh, uh, focusing on, on uh, policy optimization, cost efficiency, and so forth. But a, a rather large uh, part of, of the research that we do is more on the acceptance side of policy instruments. And this is w what I will mainly talk about today. What happened now? Um, yeah. So that's what I will focus on. Uh, and there are some reasons for that. So uh, when I started to study ex policy acceptance, 15, 20 years ago, no one understood why. And I tried to sort of sell in the importance of those questions. Uh, and now all in a sudden, uh, it seems like uh, uh, various actors and so forth realize that this is actually quite important. Um, and a reason why it's important in this room, I think, is that uh, for the last years, or starting with the Paris Agreement, basically, and the NDCs. It means that a lot of countries who have not had any reasons to implement, say, carbon taxes, all in a sudden need to do that, either to lower their emissions or at least to, keep, to make sure that they, their emissions won't be as large as they, they would be otherwise. And uh, a demonstration of, the, of the, uh, uh, this trend is uh, 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 quite recently started network or coalition of ministers of finance uh, jointly working on how carbon taxes or carbon pricing can be implemented in various countries, not only developed countries but also in global south. And uh, when I checked earlier this week, or was it last week? I don't know what day it is. 
whatever, a few days ago anyway, 52 countries have now signed this coalition. And uh, some of us here in the room participated in a, in a conference that the Swedish ministers, Minister of Finance organized in October. And it became quite apparent that many of the questions that the countries have to deal with is not only to find the, the optimal uh, sort of tax or, or price mechanism, but it's also about how to implement it and how to make sure that it will actually be, be realized. And this is sort of what I will talk a little bit about. Uh, so on the one hand, it's, it's very important to, to optimize the instruments, but it's also important to generate acceptance for, for these instruments. And it's important for two reasons. So in theory, sort of, it, acceptance of a policy is important because unless there is enough support, politicians won't dare to implement it. However, unless there is acceptance for these policy instruments, once they have been implemented, they won't be uh, uh, complied with. Well, people will try to cheat them uh, the best they can. So that, that is sort of the theory. But if we look out in, in practice, the real world, we also know that acceptance really matters. So uh, this is a reminder. And I think that many of the activities that we now see on this continent may, may also be sort of a, a signal of the importance that, that decision making is accepted by the public and various involved actors. And, uh, and an additional dimension to this is that an, an extra policy could actually make an already existing uh, resistance to increase. So it turn, can turn bigger and bigger, like in Chile or in France. Uh, I think I will come back to the Macron design of the, the, the French carbon tax later. Uh, but this is a little bit of the background. So now let me give you a, a short trash course in uh, where the study of, of policy acceptance is today. So I've tried to sort of summarize our own research and also others' research to give you an overview. And the, the core idea or the core question is this. What affects policy support or policy acceptance? Don't get scared now, please. Uh, so this is what it looks like. I will try to walk you through this uh, uh, conceptual model a little bit. And I will focus in particular on the, the closer we come to policy acceptance. But um, research showed that uh, various psychological factors affect policy acceptance. These, are, these factors are quite often, but not always, uh, uh, sort of similar as the ones that explains pro-environmental behavior. But uh, so values, for example, it's, it's obviously important that if you, if, if you have a more universalistic uh, uh, value orientation, you're more likely to support a policy that is sort of beneficial for the collective compared to if you're more egoistic. Uh, if you have beliefs about nature, beliefs about the environment, if you are concerned about the environment, that is also an important trigger. Uh, but these things also generate personal norms. So guides, uh, guidelines that you carry within you, saying how to behave in a certain situation. And the conflict between personal norms and your personal values is sort of this traditional uh, uh, co uh, cognitive dissonance. So, so you feel sort of uneasy if you, you, uh, if you don't act in accordance with your norms and values. So that's one thing. Another thing is, no, there, trust. So on the one hand, uh, it matters whether you have tri high trust or reliance in other people. And uh, often studies show that the more trust you have in 
other people's behavior and whether they will comply with the policy or whatever, the less supportive you are to the policies, which I think can make sense because you, uh, if you trust that others will act pro-environmentally, there is no need for a policy instrument to change behavior. Then you believe that others will change anyway, maybe including yourself. I think per political trust is, is more important and, and interesting here or institutional trust, I call it here, because it has both to do with trust in the input side of the political system, but also in the output side. So it's, it's a matter of whether you trust in the government, in politicians, in the political institutions, but it's also very important whether you trust in the, the more administrative institutions, in the administration that is supposed to implement the policies and make them running. The lower the trust in those institutions, the more likely that you will object against a policy. I will come back to the, this in, in a couple of minutes. Are you following me? You're still awake? Yes, good, thank you. But this is where I would like to focus today, something we call policy-specific beliefs, uh, which has a, a, a very strong uh, effect on or, or an impact on, on uh, people's propensity to accept a policy. So it's more concerned with the policy instrument as such. What will be the consequences, for example, for me personally, so personal outcome expectancies, the, the first box there, how will it affect my economy, how will it affect my family, my sort of socioeconomic situation? That's one thing that, that, uh, uh, that matters. Fairness is also very important if people consider that the policy instrument is fairly designed, but also if the outcome of, of, of the, the policy will have a fair effect, sort of. And I think this is a key to understand why the French carbon tax failed completely. Uh, so, uh, and define, uh, also freedom. So how it affects my, my liberty to, to uh, move around, for example, if we speak about transportation policies. If, my li if, I could, if I believe that the policy will e decrease my freedom of movement, uh, I will be less supportive. And finally, effectiveness, which I find quite interesting. Because uh, in, in much of social science, environmental social science, maybe not econo economics, but political science, sociology, and so forth. It has been a, a, a taken for granted tense relationship between, on the one hand, acceptance, on the other hand, effectiveness. So many have taken for granted that the more effective a policy instrument is, the less people will support it. Now, if we look at many policy instruments that have been implemented, there has often been a resistance before it has been implemented. But once people see that it has intended effect, the support tend to come gradually afterwards, after the implementation. And I think this is a very important policy implication. So if you introduce a, a, a policy, it might be that you should do this either gradually or in a test period, and then you evaluate whether it has intended effects or not. Um, yes. Now you think that I'm done, don't you? Well, I'm not. I will make things even <laughs> worse. So there are also a number of contextual factors that uh, I've heard several talk about uh, uh, both in, in, in previous panels and also uh, among the papers. And there is an excellent paper in the afternoon that I will discuss that also highlights the importance of context. Uh, so there is a, a quite significant literature showing that social norms affect people's propensity to support policies. So depending on in which social context I feel that I belong, if, if I belong to a, a context where people are against policies, then I, I tend to be less supportive myself. Political culture, quality of government, history. So how has, for example, the government performed previously affects my support for, for a, a policy. And also, of course, the economic situation in a country. I will focus here on two things. 
political culture and quality of government. I will soon explain what I mean with that. Uh, political culture. Um, it could be, or, or it, I mean, in a sw country like Sweden, I know Thomas don't buy this, but in a, in a country like Sweden, we have a relatively easy relationship to taxes. We are used to taxes. We know that taxes has tend to have intended effect. And the idea of introducing yet another, say, environmental tax is less problematic compared to trying to introduce a tax in an Anglo-Saxon country where you all the way since the unbloody revolution have hated taxes for pretty good reasons. Uh, so there are cultural differ differences in, in countries. Some, in some cultures, some policy instruments are more likely to be supported than in others. And regarding quality of government, uh, that's a sort of collective uh, concept for a number of characteristics of, of the governmental system in the country. So it's, it has to do about rule of law, transparency, uh, and not the least corruption. And uh, this is a research area where we really need to do more. But in more cross-section cross studies that have been done, it's quite clearly that in countries with high level of corruption, people are less supportive to market-based instruments. So they obviously don't want the government to deal with money because they don't trust that they will be used in a proper way. While in there are more rule, uh, sort of legal regulations are, are supported. While in low corrupt contexts, market-based instruments tend to be sort of pri pri prioritized compared to, to legal instruments. Now, where does this take us? Well, um, I'm thinking that this research already gives us some, some important implications in regard to policy. Uh, that there are a number of factors that need to be considered when we design policy instruments, at least if we want them to be implemented and complied with in the end. So I will just give you a few examples of how you can reasoning uh, based on, 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 on previous findings. <clears throat> and I will focus on the policy-specific beliefs beca because I think that's where you have the largest chance to sort of adjust for these factors. I mean, if, people, it, if it turns out that people's values is, is a driver for, for uh, not accepting a policy, a certain policy, what can you do? You can't really go out and change people's values like, like this. That takes time. Not even norms are that easily changed. Not to speak of trust. That's a long project to increase trust in society. But you can do things with policy instruments to make them more sensitive to these policy-specific beliefs. And most of these other values are actually channeled through these beliefs. So I would want you to listen more or, or study more carefully the, 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 the the beliefs about policy instruments. So let's let's assume that let's assume that fairness is a key driver in a country for for uh, resistance to a policy instrument. Then, uh, if we take carbon tax as an example, then to do like in Canada, to to pay back the revenues. Uh, and especially if you do it like in Canada, that you pay back equally to everyone, regardless whether you drive or not, whether you're rich or poor, probably increases the, the uh, propensity or the probability that it will be possible to implement it. And I think France, Canada is a wonderful example here. I mean, in, in many respects, similar with same political culture, history, and so forth. And, and in Canada, uh, uh, a carbon tax was implemented quite successfully, and I think, uh, according to the Canadian experts that I've talked to, they believe that it will remain. I, in France, okay. in France, they implemented or suggested a carbon tax where the revenues were also paid back, but only to those who earn most, by a decrease of the wealth tax. And if you think that, I mean, if, if you 
consider that the reason why people find it unfair is that it affects those who earn least and those who have longest distance to travel. Then to use the revenues not to encourage those groups, but to encourage those who will not be affected by the tax anyway, economically, is a really, really stupid approach, uh, I must say. But you can, in various ways, combine a carbon tax with various compensation schemes to adjust for fairness, uh, negative fairness perceptions. Uh, if freedom is an important driver, then one should perhaps consider combining a, a carbon tax with various policies that make it easier for people to, to uh, find alternatives to driving. More buses, or I don't know what it could be. Uh, if it's about effectiveness, and I think this is a, a very important point, because here I think that politicians and decision makers are generally very, very poor at explaining the, the, the importance of the policy instrument and why we introduce it. It's usually not because the government wants more money. It could be one goal, but it's to, to internalize externalities. And if we can demonstrate that a carbon tax is the most cost-effective way of doing this, and we can demonstrate data that it has been successful in other countries, I think it would be much easier to sell it in. And when I look at the debates and how these policy instruments are, are, are often sold in, uh, it, they're terrible at marketing it. Um, was it 10 minutes or seconds? Now it's less, now it's five. That's exactly what I need. Uh, and to, to sort of adjust for the contextual factors, it could be things like uh, maybe call the policy instrument something else than a tax. Or, uh, yeah, as an example, or we'll try to find what are the reasons why people in a certain political context are negative to a, to a policy instrument that is more posit positively considered in another political context. And low quality of government. I have only speculations here. I don't know. But I'm pretty certain that it would be possible to design a carbon tax where the, where the whole system is basically dealt with outside the government. Uh, so that the revenues are both uh, sort of uh, brought in and distributed back without that the government need to be in charge of, of this, these operations. But it's pure speculations from my side. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, sure that it works. My key point here is that one should think much more in terms of policy packages. So we have a core policy instrument that we want to implement. And maybe we have to give up a little bit of things like cost effectiveness and effectiveness in order to not only design the perfect policy instrument, but also have it implemented. Uh, so second best solutions, in a sense, would be better than no solutions at all. OK, here is my last, uh, if it ever shows up. It was a terrible map, but we all live there anyway. There is one significant weakness with the policy acceptance research so far. And that is that it has mainly been conducted here and here. So what I've said now is more or less, at least, a, a sort of a Western world OECD focus. And I think that for the NDCs to be successfully developed and in, uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, to be uh, successfully uh, developed in, let's say, the global south. We need to do research also here. We have, I, I have really tried to search, and it's very difficult to find systematic research on policy acceptance in other contexts than the OECD context, basically. And you know where I'm heading now, don't you? <laughs> but, so, if we have these things in mind, and we don't want this to happen, I would like to uh, sort of open up an invitation 
if anyone in the EFT region offices or the countries are interested in conducting and be replicating and conducting policy acceptance studies also in those contexts. No one would be happier than me to continue a dialogue on how this can be done. And I will be available the whole day. You know what I look like now. And uh, please approach me if you have any interest in these uh, issues. Thank you so much. Plastics group is looking at um, behavioral interventions in different countries in the EFD centers in how we can um, elicit um, policy acceptance with regards to plastic bag use. So I think the work that you present here is really relevant for what we do, and we look forward to reading more on that. Can I give the floor um, two minutes to, for some questions? We don't have much time, but it would be like, nice to hear you. Did you want me to ask something? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sperker, for a very interesting presentation. I have two comments, or maybe you can give some talks about that. The first one is that we see that this new generation of young people, they are more concerned about climate change, about many environmental challenges. <laughs> However, as I see, for instance, in, in, in my country or in other countries, is that, yes, they, they complain about the, the new challenges of, of uh, carbon emissions, but when, as an economist, you see that one of the ways to change that path is to include taxes. But when you tell them, to tell the, when you tell young people, you have to pay taxes, you say, so they want a better world with less em CO2 emissions, but when they know that they have to pay taxes, they, they don't see the connection between these two issues. How can we try to uh, connect these young people that uh, policy instruments is one way just to, 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 to find the, the best path to reduce emissions. And the second comment is about, uh, for instance, in, in, in now in, in, in Bogota, uh, for these driver restriction programs, they implemented the possibility, since we cannot have the congestion charge, uh, the, the, okay. they, since we cannot, we cannot have the congestion charge as you have in Stockholm and Gothenburg, uh, they give the chance to everybody to pay a fee per year to have the possibility to circulate or to drive the car all the time. So, and this includes some complaints from, from people about fairness, because rich people can pay this, uh, this voucher per year to drive every day. So that's something to comment. Okay. <coughs> yep, uh, really relevant questions, both of them. Um, regarding the first uh, uh, question, yeah, that is tricky. Um, I guess it's, it's a matter of convincing them that the taxes will have intended effect and that they will uh, sort of make the world a little bit better. And uh, I think it, it's, it's a great pedagogic challenge uh, all the time to, to sell in environmental policy instruments. Uh, an alternative way would be, of course, to say that the revenues from the tax will be used for something that is beneficial for young people, to, to make it easier for education or, or to transport yourself without needing a car or something. Uh, that could be another way. Uh, but I think I need to know more about the specific case uh, and what the opinion looked like. Uh, regarding the second question, so, so is it the legal reason why you can't have congestion charges? It is. Yeah. Hmm. I don't have a good, a good answer yet. I think I need to think a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I'll get back to you. Yes, sure. Thank you. I was, asked, I was asked to ask a quick question. I'm German, so the question will be, will be uh, quick and short. Um, I would like to um, uh, raise the question about, like, uh, have you thought about the reason uh, or the role of inequality and, uh, you know, and the growing division of, uh, you know, of our societies, at least in the Western world, and uh, which of course affects the acceptability of 
of uh, climate change policy and, and also I would be curious to hear uh, what this could imply for the global south. Yeah. <clears throat> I, th I think that, uh, uh, first of all, in many countries in the global south, uh, a carbon tax would be a, a, a more reliable way of generating funding compared to income taxes, for example. I think it's, it's difficult sort of for various reasons to bring in uh, tax revenues from, from uh, those activities. So a carbon tax would probably increase the, the, the amount of money that the government can manage to bring in. And then if those revenues are used for poverty reduction or investment in, in, uh, in things that can uh, reduce poverty and inequalities uh, it, and this is shown to have intended effect I think that uh, that, that that might be a a, a, yeah, a a possibility and also something that I, I talked with the uh, what's her, his name from the African Development Bank Kevin yeah so so he, he we talked about uh, this project of, of uh, uh, developing uh, uh, solar plants in in uh, in Sahara, and how unlikely it was to have all the the countries on board, but th they have, and in this plan, which they call uh, I think desert for power or something like that, uh, climate change is not mentioned at all. It's about generating funding and, and increase the economies in these countries that would be beneficial from a social and poverty perspective. And, and climate was never in the negotiations at all, although we know that it will have significant positive effects for the climate as well. So it could be th this thing I talked about before, depending on what you call things and how you approach things. Uh, I don't know if that was an answer, but... Thank you, Sveker, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I have two very quick questions. The, the, the first one has to do with the interaction uh, between policy goals. Uh, with policy? Policy goals. Goals, uh, okay. The things that you want to achieve. And in many of our uh, countries, uh, air pollution, congestion, and the, the you know, collapse of the transport infrastructure uh, causes an enormous reduction in quality of life. And that is also associated with carbon emissions. So it, the, the possibility of uh, deploying taxes that are corrective of both local policy goals, and uh, I think that, that would be interesting to, to push uh, forward. And the second comment, which is related, is the uh, one thing that is missing from many of our conversations is how carbon taxes fit within the broader policy mix that the country already has implemented. So I, I worked with, with Costa Rica in designing their, their uh, or our carbon tax, and um, we didn't go through. Uh, but uh, part of the problem was that there was a, there's a lot of things you can fix that has powerful implications for carbon emissions yeah. without necessarily resorting to the establishment of the carbon tax. No. So this understanding of, of the real policy mix that is uh, the ecosystem of policies that in which a carbon tax will have to live yeah, I think it's important also to consider. Yeah. I totally agree. And I think this, this is a beautiful example of how we could collaborate. You, you, have the, the, you are the country experts, and you know what policy instruments would be best in your context. And, uh, and we can perhaps contribute a little bit with how can they be designed also to, to be as acceptable as possible. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's a... It's a good example. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Swacker, and you're all welcome to talk more to Swacker afterwards, as he said. Um, next, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Olof Johansson Stenman from Yon um, Gothenburg University Economics Department. Um, He's a person dear to my heart. He was my supervisor many years ago, and he's always been an incredible inspiration to me. He's really one of the greatest intellectuals that I've ever met. He spent a lot of his time thinking about exactly why we're not 
homo economicus, as um, most economists tend to think, and, and uh, riveting thoughts around this. All of us published in, in journals where I think most of us aspire to publish, like um, Journal of Public Economics, Nature Sustainability, American Economic Journal, Applied um, Economic Policy, the, just the list continues. So it's um, uh, very high tier stuff and we look forward to hearing more about what Oliver is currently doing. He's talking to us today about optimal taxation and public policy when people care about social comparisons. Thanks, Olaf. Thank you. Um, so, let's see how this works. Yes. Uh, so this is. Uh, I was asked for. So Thomas suggested this team actually. Um, Thomas Turner. I was a bit su surprised initially, and I was thinking of. So this is work I've done for for many years together with many many people. Uh, of some people in this room um, about related comparison stuffs, how that um, affects it, uh, policy in various ways, and I was thinking not particularly about developing countries in this context, although of course that's part of, of, of the problems nevertheless, but I was thinking that uh, if you're super poor, uh, I mean it's the survivor, uh, surviving is the first thing, relative stuff, status stuff and so forth may not be the most important, but on the other hand when thinking more about it, uh, uh, the policy implications uh, if super rich people make some errors, it's not that, that important, right? But if, if, people in, if, if the policy is bad with respect to these issues in, in developing countries, this is really important issues. In that sense, I think this theme may be even more important in a developing country context. Uh, so I will then, I was asked by Thomas of summarizing or go through uh, some insights over the years uh, that I've done in, in, that I worked with in this field. So, Okay, so I see this as a part of behavioral economics, so in, in some sense, a deviation from homo economicus, as Martin mentioned, um, where, where behavioral economics is often seen as something deviation, where, where people are not necessarily super rational, as we assume, they're not necessarily perfectly consistent over time, uh, they do typically have self-control problems, contrary to our problems, uh, people are not completely selfish, luckily, uh, and moreover, people are not perfectly atomistic in the sense that people tend to do care about uh, what other people think about them and how, what, what, what they do, what they buy, uh, and how they appear in public and so forth. Uh, so in this talk, I will solely uh, discuss the fourth of those um, sort of deviation from home economics in a sense, although I think all of them are very important in an environment and developing country uh, perspective, um, and I've done some work in the other areas as well, but, but I will, uh, as I said, from now on, solely focus on the last one. Um, so, more specifically then, I will, I will mostly talk about the fact that people, uh, basically all people, I think, well, and I will come back to that, uh, care about uh, relative comparisons, and it's basically hardwired into us, and it's partly, of course, a cultural phenomenon, and we do that for intrinsic, in some sense, uh, reasons, and partly instrumental reasons, because they're also instrumental uh, through market mechanisms and so forth, why we do care about uh, relative comparisons. Uh, so, in this talk, I will start with uh, some empirical issues and trying to identify whether this is the case, some indications that we do that, and then move over to, to theoretical and normative or welfare implications of that. I will spend more time on the latter, but I will spend some time on the former as well. Um, so, uh, 
and most of, of, of this will be super short summaries of insights from paper, sort of one slide per, per paper often, uh, so we'll see. So the, the first paper we started with actually in this field was, um, can be summarized in this thought experiment that we asked uh, a number of students in Sweden basically, uh, and, and you can think about how you would respond to that. Suppose you're making a choice for your grandchild, and since we're dealing with students, it was imagined grandchild then, uh, who, lived in, uh, who live in a society A or B, and in society A, your grandchild makes $6,000 per month, uh, average income is $8,000 per month, and in society B, uh, you, you see the numbers yourself, right? And the question is then, uh, not which society is best, but what is the society which is best for your grandchild, in the sense that we, your grandchild will be mo most content. Everything else is, is the same between those societies. And the point is not that the answer is obvious here. Um, the point is that it's not obvious. So according to conventional economic theory, you would obviously go for A because 6,000 is more than 5,000, end of story. But for most people, that's a non-trivial choice. And for many people, actually, pick B alternative here. And you can vary in the number, of course. And if you vary in the number, and then you, you see where people tend to be indifferent between those times where, where you either care about the absolute difference versus the relative uh, 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 difference uh, or uh, between the societies, you could, you could quantify the extent to which people seem to think that relative income matters versus absolute income. And, you can, we, and then we quantify that in a parameter that we call the degree of positionality that we then uh, play around with in, in basically all uh, subsequent papers. Uh, so what we found basically then, based on these type of, of, of questions, uh, repeated questions, was that on average, if people get an additional income increase, 40% maybe roughly uh, as a mean value seem to be that people care about increased relative income rather than absolute one, and the remaining then is due to the absolute one, but uh, okay. And then, but you may think, okay, this was in Sweden, this is an odd country up to the North Pole, uh, is this the same in other countries? So we did similar stuff in Costa Rica, and we had good connections in Costa Rica, of course, is one of the reasons. Um, and we're also thinking, hmm, yeah, you compare income, but maybe you compare other stuff as well. You compare maybe more in some dimension than in other dimensions. And uh, some things are more easily observable, for example, cars, housing, other things less so, a vacation time, uh, the insurances, and so forth. And we, we found uh, the degree to which people compare themselves uh, overall is similar in Costa Rica, Costa Rican students and Swedish ones. Uh, and we found, according to what we expected than what you would expect, I guess, that people compare themselves more uh, to the relative importance, the relative comparison is more important for goods than cars and housing relative to vacation time and insurance. Uh, and you may think, okay, that's for students, but students, after all, what do they know? Um, and, and, uh, and what about real people? Uh, so we did a uh, representative uh, study in Sweden, with a, sample, a representative sample in Sweden, and uh, doing basically the same thing, but in a different methodological context. We had the choice experiment, uh, make, make, letting them make repeated choices, and we found roughly the same result, actually, the, the same degree of positionality, as we call it, and similar uh, also among, among uh, representative sample in, in Sweden. But then you may think, okay, uh, those social comparisons, uh, maybe that's not only, I mean, we compare ourselves in many dimensions, and there's also group perspective, groups matter, it's not only individuals that matter. So we were thinking, thinking of well, which society that, that maybe groups are a particularly uh, important, and I was thinking of oh, India, of course, the caste system, and I'm thinking, okay, obviously it's not only that you have to it's good to have a high income compared to that, say, the average in India. It's also uh, which caste you are, belong to. It's important for your relative well-being and, and status and so forth. Uh, so then we're thinking, okay, people compare themselves both. Uh, it's nice to belong to a high caste in, in welfare sense, but it's also important to be uh, performing well within your caste. So we were, we were uh, trying to measure those things and we found that overall, again, the extent that people care about relative comparisons seems to be similar also among Indian students in this case as in other countries. Uh, and that, that it matters both that, both that they are belonging to a high sort of status caste 
but also that they perform well within their cast. And in relative terms, we found that actually the latter was more important, but it's of course a bit context specific and, and, and depending on exactly how you define stuff. So now, <clears throat> so that's one method we played around with uh, empirically for quite some time. There are of course other methods. And uh, so I will make uh, thought experiments for you here, right? Uh, and and, and this, is, this is the method that's actually used. So suppose half of you initially, let's say, that round, you were getting uh, some food to eat here, you're getting pieces of cucumber. Maybe not super tasty, but it's, I mean, it's not bad either, right? And you get super nice uh, grapes. Okay, so you're the lucky one, maybe. They're very tasty. So that's the first stage of the experiment. Now we move to the second stage. Those of you initially were giving that not so nice cucumber, you are now in the second stage given, can you guess? Another piece of the not so super tasty cucumber, while you guys are getting more grapes. Okay? And then the question is how would you, cucumber guys, feel about that? Okay, so there has been some, some research about this. And uh, Franz de Waal and others have done studies, behavioral responses in many dimensions of that. So uh, I will illustrate uh, that, uh, actually, those behavioral responses. Can you please turn on, on that uh, video clip? And see, the other one sees that. No. See, so he gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. For the beginning. and you will see what happens. So we're getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. Okay. Okay, go back. So, um, this, this indicates that it's somehow hardwired these things. It's not just a uh, uh, Ex ex existing in certain cultures and so forth, right? It's not super easy to interpret that. Of course, you can interpret it in different, um, uh, different ways and so forth. But, but I think it's, it's pretty cute, and, and I think it says something about not only uh, that, uh, on the, uh, not only our type of primates, but, but more, more, more generally. And, and so forth. Okay, but there are yet other methods, of course. There are happiness studies, how happy are you these days kind of studies, where typically in most cases I've found that those relative comparisons are indeed important. There are evolutionary studies. Maybe mating is the most obvious example where relative, uh, relative uh, resource and so forth are important in, in, in that sort of marriage market, for example, you may think of. And there are studies by Ryo and Becker and so forth in, in, in uh, playing around. There are several uh, evolutionary models where, where it makes sense that people would have preferences where you care about relative comparisons rather than only absolute ones, right? And there are brain science things, you have people are lying, lying down in fMRI machines and they're making choices and then you can see directly in the brain whether you care about those relative stuff and only absolute stuff and you tend to find that people care about that as well. The physiological health related measures both animals and human beings. And for human beings, for example, there are for some suicide studies but, and, and for animals such as this one, but there are also, you're comparing dogs, they have different sizes of meats, for example, and you could measure stress hormones in the dog where you can have another dog with, which has larger meat uh, piece between them and so forth. Okay. So, yet most people are, ourselves are thinking that, well, hmm, but do we care that much about relative stuff because we don't like that 
idea very much. Um, so we did another study where we were asking a um, general sample of Swedish how what they were prioritized when they were buying a car, what they put a large weight on and so forth. And most people said, well, security is very important, environmental performance is important, status is not at all important for me. And then we asked them about what do you think about other people's when they're making a choice for buying a car. Then status became much more important and environmental stuff much less important. And then we asked a sample of, of car, car dealers and what they thought and they were somewhere in between. Overall, that indicates that, that people do care about status when they're buying a car, but um, and to a larger extent than people and ourselves tend to, tend to think of and acknowledge and, and realize ourselves. Okay, moving to the policy side. And this is a quotation from uh, the British economist Richard Layard. Uh, whether we like it or not, human beings are rivalrous. That is, we care about not only what we do, but in comparison with others. And it is time for mainstream economics to incorporate this key fact of human nature. And that's how I see that uh, myself. I think this is not a special case that sometimes these things matter. I think it always matter. That is not to say that we should always model them. In the same way as people, the information is always incomplete, there is almost all almost always, maybe even always, some degree of asymmetric information doesn't mean that we should all, always model that, but we should, we should keep that into account. And sometimes, maybe even often, the normative policy implications will be drastically different when we acknowledge such effects. Okay, so this is, we, we are not do, the first ones do, doing uh, normative models, taking these effects into account. There are de studies dealing with income tax policy before, and public good provision, social insurance, growth issues, environmental externalities, stabilization policies, and, 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 and even more stuff. So I would start with, in this field, uh, the, the first sort of theoretical paper we were uh, writing about that. Uh, and I will, I will spend some more time on this paper because the methodology used here uh, have been used in, uh, in most other papers, not all, not all of the subsequent papers I will talk about briefly, uh, but, but, uh, but, but uh, many of them. Uh, and and uh, one important, I think, in the um, contribution of this paper is that it extends uh, previous literature to non-legal taxation. I will come back to that, but maybe even more important, it's based on the measure to which people care, so empirical measure to, of the extent that people do care about relative comparisons uh, and relative income and relative consumption. And as such, it's not only uh, and uh, you, you can get implications of how much does this matter for income taxation, public good provisions, and so forth. So nonlinear taxation obviously is, is uh, something that we have and can have in most countries. And uh, uh, you may think it just makes things unnecessarily complicated. We have to simplify the world, so why not dealing with linear income taxes? And I think one important reason is that uh, the, the result you get, even if the model per se seems to be more complicated, the normative implications, if you interpret the results, are often more complex in linear taxation models than in non-linear income taxation models. And that because that, that then you will have an amalgam of this rather artificial linearity restriction and the information limitation that you have. And so then that makes those results typically very complex and hard to interpret, uh, and, and, the, and, the re, uh, and the intuition for, for economic purposes. So in this, this paper and in many other papers, we will, we will adopt the simplified versions of that Murley's continuous type model, which is the Stiglitz uh, and Stern uh, model of two, two type select, selection models that you might interpret, you might think of this as a, as a simple version of making this design approach to, to this problem. And we, we typically have two types of people instead of an infinite number of types, low ability type, high ability type in terms of productivity. Each individual care about own consumption, own leisure, uh, and some uh, public good. And on top of that, relative consumption. They want to have more than others, dislike having less than others. So then we can model that in terms of a, of a utility function, of course. I'm, 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 I'm terribly sorry. I, uh, for a long time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, um, yeah, yeah. So this is, um, this is an illustration of that limited uh, cognitive ability that I talked about initially. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Frederick. Um, okay, um, 
that's where we are now anyway. Um, so I will, I will maybe um, still uh, repeat what I've said just from this time. Right? So the model, mm -hmm. modeling type, and those of you who very much dislike models, now is the type for, time for, for, for uh, checking emails. Um, so there are two types, uh, a low ability type and two abil high ability types. I will, I will close down this actually. Um, so, and they differ only in productivity and also preferences actually. People, as in conventional models, people care about their own consumption, their own leisure, uh, which is given by how much time there is in, in, in the world, given how much you work, and uh, the amount of public good that, you are, uh, that is available in the economy. And on top of those conventional stuff, you care about relative consumption, and you want to have more and dislike having less than others. And then you will get the utility function can express that from that. Uh, so, well, how, how we, where we are? Okay. Okay. So, so based on this theoretical model, we can then uh, quantify and we could we could identify the degree of positionality that I talked about initially, the extent on the margin to which you care about relative consumption and not, not only absolute consumption. So, uh, that's parameter alpha here or variable actually will take an approach of one where you're solely on the margin, care about the relative stuff, you don't care about absolute consumption at all, whereas it takes the, uh, the, the, the value zero when you only care about uh, absolute consumption. So that would be the conventional model. And, and, uh, and then you can have all versions in between. And of course, individual maximize utility, as, as we typically do, subject to budget constraints, nothing strange. We assume a linear production function uh, implying gross wages and fixed, uh, are fixed and profits are zero, not because it's realistic, but lots, that's because it makes life easier for both readers and authors of this paper. Uh, and it doesn't in, it's easy to generalize it, actually, so it, it's not important at all. Uh, the government, on the other hand, maximizes either a uh, bergson samuelson social welfare function or it identifies a parade to efficient allocation that will give the same result. Uh, it will maximize utility for some, one type, let's say some type one, the low ability type, subject to keeping utility constant for type two individuals. Uh, and the information and assumptions are conventional in this optimal uh, taxation literature. You can observe income, you can observe consumption, hence you can tax income, you can tax uh, consumption. You cannot observe directly ability, you cannot uh, observe directly leisure. And that's why we are in the second best problem. Okay, uh, and on top of that overall resource constraint and the fact that the individual will maximize utility subject to its own budget constraint, the government will then face a self-selection constraint because the governments want to redistribute from the high ability type, which tend to be the high income types, to the low ability type. But in order to, but in order to be able to do that, it has to prevent the high ability type from mimicking, mimicking being a low ability type. That is, the high ability type could work much less and hence ob obtain the same gross income and hence, less, less and, and, and hence the, uh, the same uh, net income as the low ability type. But then it would not be able to redistribute anything, so that, that would not be a good idea from the government point of view. So it must prevent them from doing that. So that implies that is sort of the second best modification of those results. Okay. So, and, and the result turns out to be in the first best case where you disregard those second best limitations, surprisingly easy. So in, if we would disregard relative comparison stuff in such a world, okay, what, what would the Pareto efficient uh, taxation be? That would be zero, right? Because taxation or distorting, we are learning that from micro 101, right? But here, taking, uh, if we don't take uh, second best stuff into account, it would be the average of the degree to which people care about relative consumption on the margin, which is maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.5, according to some studies, even higher, according to some studies, Com much larger than otherwise. And in the, in the, in the more uh, general second best model, of course, things become much more complex. I, I've been writing down the very simplified version of it then, because the, the optimal tax would constitute of the, the, the tax rate that would be the case without relative stuff, tau, plus one minus tau times that uh, relative comparison uh, uh, variable alpha bar. And then you have another second best effects that I would not talk about at all now because time is flying. 
Um, nevertheless, what does that mean? So on average, the tax, optimal marginal tax rate would be much higher in such a world where people do care about real consumption compared to when they do not. And the intuitive reason can be thought of as, as in, in the conventional world, on the margin, whether you should work one more hour or not, uh, then if you work one more hour, that's taxed. If you don't work one more hour, it's not taxed. It's better for the government and for society if you work one more hour. But in this world, world it's not at all clear, because if you work one more hour, then the relative consumption of everybody else will decrease because your relative consumption will increase. So you will have an offsetting externality that goes in a com complete opposite direction. So it's not at all clear that people on the margin will work too little in such a world. Public good provision. So uh, consider a simplified case. Um, it's not super simplified, so I will not go into what the, that separability structure means, but it's, it's a commonly made simplification. Uh, and in the, this particular case, um, you know, in, in the conventional case, the optimal provision rule for public goods would be the Samuelson rule. Some, some of marge, people's marginal willingness to pay or marginal rate substitution on the left-hand side should equal to the marginal rate of transformation or the relative, co relative price or the cost per unit on the right-hand side. Here, we get the modification alpha bar, one minus alpha bar. That is, we should provide much more if alpha bar is substantially larger than zero than in the conventional world. Why is that? Well, the reason is that the public good, then you don't have that zero-sum element. But the private good you have, because you have that negative externality. If you consume one more dollar, others will have a reduced a relative consumption uh, corresponding to that. But for the public good increase, you would not have that, because we would all have the same amount of public good. Hence, for that reason, the reason to provide more public goods in such work. Um, Yet, the interpretation in terms of marginal willingness to, stay, to pay is subtle, and, and uh, I would drop that, but uh, you have to be careful when doing that. Okay, so far we talked about static models, but in reality, of course, we're living over time, and we can also use tax instruments that deals with our changes in, in, in income and, and capital income over time, and then we need a dynamic model. So suppose we would have a dynamic model with, with the possibility to tax, tax uh, capital income. What would happen then? Um, so we deal with that in an optimal uh, in overlapping generation model where you can use both nonlinear labor and capital income taxation. Um, so the, the insights from the, the static labor income uh, optimal taxation results carry over largely to this dynamic framework. The capital income taxation uh, under some condition, you should have it, otherwise not. Um, uh, and we also generalize it in some other dimensions that will not spend much time on. And you may think of even further that you can compare your, 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 your uh, relative comparisons not only with those currently living, maybe you compare backward with what you had in the past and what other people have in the past and previous generations and so forth that would be part of your preference structure then it would get more complicated. But again, the main insights regarding the importance of, of the relative comparisons for the, deg the, the, the degree of or the size of the optimal margin labor income taxation carryovers also to such a rich, richer framework. Um, OK, and then you can think, OK, this is a closed, closed market economy. But in reality, capital income is problematic in, in uh, uh, in, um, in Sweden, for example, it's a small closed economy and, and people can, use, can save a lot of their money abroad and how would that impact uh, the optimal results? Then, then obviously it, it, the, the, the capital income taxation will have a smaller room uh, if, there is, if the government cannot perfectly con control uh, capital income by, by a tax because people can move capital across borders and they cannot directly tax that. And then you get indirect spillover effect on the labor income taxation stuff. So um, next, we talked about public goods briefly, but some public goods are of a dynamic character, more of a stock type character. Uh, and the greenhouse effect is maybe the prime example of that. Uh, so what would be the optimal choice rule for goods like uh, Stock, stock externality of public goods, such as 
de uh, reducing the greenhouse effect in such a world where you take relative stuff into account. So we play around with that with a dynamic optimal nonlinear income taxation models. And again, the qualitative insights of providing more of those goods in the dynamic framework, the, the, the results from the static framework, that, that you, and the basic intuition also in such a framework carries over to this dynamic framework. So the reasons to optimally provide more of such a, a, a state variable public good is basically saying there are reasons for investing more in reducing climate change for the, this reason too, also in a dynamic setting. And in a dynamic setting, it's of course also that more direct question whether how, how you should choose the discount rate in order to take future costs and benefit into account. Uh, and uh, the question is, will the relative comparisons affect also those measures? And the answer is yes, and we, and we look into that in, in this paper where we compare the conventional Ramsey discount rate, you know that formula, right? Uh, that pure rate of time preferences plus uh, the, the, a measure of curvature of utility function times the growth rate per year. Uh, we compare that with what with the socially optimal uh, uh, discount rate would be and what the private individual, how that individual would choose the discount rate and we find that uh, the social discount rate tends to exceed the private one and maybe more important, uh, the social discount rate tends to be lower than the conventional Ramsey one when taking relative stuff into account. What does that imply? That implied that the present value of future cost of climate change will be larger in such a way when we take those relative stuff into account. And we, we were also discussing the order of magnitudes of that given the empirical estimates of those relative concerns and we conclude that there might be, may be actually substantial uh, modifications of the optimality rule due to relative comparisons. Um, so, most of those models, people compare about relative compare. People care about relative com uh, relative consumption, but not about relative leisure. And we had some empirical evidence that people do indeed care much more about relative comparison than relative leisure. But maybe they still care a bit about relative leisure too. And indeed, if you think of the Veblen theory of the leisure class, one of those economists who were introducing those status relative comparison stuff in economics in 1899 said that. Hybrid manners and ways of living are items of conformity to the normal conspicuous leisure and conspicuous consumption. So maybe we somehow need to take that into account as well. So we do that in a paper and we find that relative leisure does indeed have some offsetting role, but it's non-symmetric and it interacts with, with, uh, uh, with um, distributional leases in a complex way. And maybe more important, the, the modification of the optimal provision rule for, for public goods remains even if you care about relative leisure, regardless of how much you care about relative leisure. Mm? But then you may think, thinking about Veblen one more time, and you may think, but is it really the amount of relative, uh, of relative leisure that people were thinking about? Uh, or is it the fact that leisure uh, make it more effective to signal your relative wealth? So intuitively, if you have bought a new BMW, but you work all the time, people will have a hard time noticing that. You need leisure to display your relative wealth, right? And then you get an interaction between relative consumption and relative leisure. So what would then happen? A lot of things would happen, of course, and tons of results, but here is one. Uh, the main insight regarding the fact that you should increase uh, the income tax relative to the conventional way, uh, world without relative comparison still holds true in this world as well. Okay? But of course, those models so far is single model, single country models, but of course we're living, we can see that here very clearly, we, have, we are many countries in the world, there are many governments making decisions, and increasingly people uh, compare themselves and you're getting increasing information. A hundred years ago, you were getting uh, information about others in your own village. Fifty years ago, maybe other people in your own country. Now we get information about other people in the world. And we compare ourselves also increasingly, and there's some empirical evidence of that, to people in other countries. And that would have implications also normatively then. Okay? So we looked into that in, in this paper for how that would affect the optimal taxation result. Um, 
So uh, the, 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 the extent that the, uh, people should still uh, increase, it would still be optimal for each individual government in Nash equilibrium to increase taxes beyond the conventional rate, but it would not take into account those spillover effects, the extent that they compare themselves to people in other countries. So in order to deal with that, we need uh, basically international tax policy coordination. And there are many reasons for international tax policy coordination for sure, but this is another one. Similarly, with public goods, you may have national public goods and global public goods. So in this model, we play around with both. And people would, when people care about those relative stuff in equilibrium, even though the government would make optimal decisions individually, uh, so the government would internalize some of those positional externalities. You would still have under provision of those public goods, both national and global public goods. The global public goods we knew before, right? But also national ones. And you get an additional reason for uh, under provision of, of global public goods in this world. And there is, of course, again then, large welfare gains from international tax policy, international policy coordination. Uh, a measure of sustainable development that is often used, at least sometimes used, is genuine savings. Uh, roughly, that is savings taking into account also changes in stocks, such as changes in the national capital. Okay, when you call and the World Bank has a number of those for a large number of countries, right? So if you would take those relative stuff into account, would those cha measures change? Uh, and the answer is yes. Would they change substantially? Yeah, quite often, quite substantially. Super brief, brief story about that. Uh, now, almost finally, um, so far, we've thought of a government dealing with the, the utility that people have, uh, but also then taking into account that people do care about those relative comparisons. Maybe the government doesn't like that. Maybe the government thinks that you jealous people, I don't care about that. I would not take that, those things into account. I will only take the direct effect into account. Whether you care about others, I disregard that. I will maximize the social welfare disregarding those stuff. And people have uh, answered or argued along those lines. Also very super smart guys like Jordan Harsani, who got the sort of uh, economics prize some years ago, argue that we have to launder sort of uh, preferences to uh, disregard those jealousy stuff and, and anti-social preferences. So what would, would, would everything then disappear, those results, when, when you do that? Um, so surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, that's not, I get a better offer from her than from you, Gunnar, in regarding timing, so uh, I, I, I've optimized to you now, so I will be in between. Uh, okay. Um, so suppose the government then thinks that you should not, uh, listening to Harsani and other super smart guys and think that no, we will not take that into account. We will disregard those relative comparison stuff. What would happen? And the answer is not so much often. And we were surprised by that. So in, in, in finding those results, so I, w I was doing the first sort of order of derivation of the results and come up with, whoa, it seems to be almost the same results. There must be something wrong. So I was sending, I was sending a mail to a Thomas Aronson, I've done most of those work with, and said that there must be something wrong. And he said, yeah, it must be something wrong probably. I will check as well. And he came back and said, well, I got the same result. Maybe there is something in that. And then ex post is not at all strange. So maybe for some of you guys, you thought it was obvious also ex ante that the results may not be that different actually for such a government, paternalist government who were laundering preferences versus a conventional welfareist government. And um, the reason is, if the government would optimize disregarding those effects, but the individuals will not, the government do not like that you take those types of stuff into account, so there's still a deviation from what the government optimized and what you do. But it's, a, it's not an externality. It, it's a deviation from the objective function of the government, government which is not non welfareistic And sometimes, and we derive cases for when those differences with the externality and those measures dealing from the paternalist policy will be exactly the same, actually, and we have a large number of simulations and stuff and show that this holds reasonably well also in a broader, broader sense. Okay. Um, yes, you know, this, I just said that, basically. So I'm almost done, so and then we have some work in progress or actually submitted stuff, so, but it's probably still work in progress. That's how it is, right? You, you think it's, you're done with it, but then you, it comes back and so forth. But, but we are dealing with 
taking into account the increasing inequality of the world, you may think that somehow, hmm, how, how could we get, uh, get use of those super rich people, that their money, right? And you were just in Wyoming thinking the same thing for EFT, right? <laughs> and, but also more generally, how could we, should we uh, adapt the tax system so, such that super rich people would contribute to, to um, and, and some of them do, right? And not least in the US and the different, different countries. How should we optimize uh, the tax system such that we would take into account that people are voluntarily giving money for public goods? Uh, such, uh, this is what we are dealing with in this paper. Uh, in the, in the, in the more, more rather complex world where people do care about relative comparisons, both in terms of income and consumption, but also with respect to charitable giving, because people want to give more than others, and it's a complete matter. Um, okay, uh, so I will, uh, to save time, not to say too much about the results, and we are dealing in the, in the accompanying paper dealing with similar issues, but here we were dealing with the increasing inequality issues directly that maybe uh, you could make rich people contribute charitable giving directly to poor people and, and deal with that in the, through the tax system. How should you deal with that optimally? Uh, and the, the, the results in both cases are, it depends on a large number of things. Things. Here, for example, it depends partly on the potential stigma effect that those people who receive, maybe they dislike give, getting uh, charitable giving directly from rich people, maybe they prefer it giving, getting it directly from the government, and this, the extent to this is the case is one element which is important, but there are, of course, many other elements. Overall, I think there is room for much more research in the field of social comparisons with respect to environment and development stuff, and more generally, uh, other social issues, social interaction issues, social norms, uh, fairness norms, fairness perceptions, uh, inequality, and so forth uh, more generally. Uh, and and um, so that's my final word. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Olof. That was um, really amazing getting an overview of all these years of research and how it's fed into each other to um, this point. I th I'm sure there's lots of questions, so um, let's start with Thomas and then Stefan. <clears throat> Thanks, Olaf, so much. That was wonderful. I hope you all noticed that these two plenaries were really about the same thing. And um, there's um, two prejudices about economists. One is that they're hard to understand, and the other is that they disregard important things like fairness uh, and only believe in a sort of selfish, atomistic individual. And this is unfair. There are some of both. But you see, uh, the basic economic story of a, of a simple individual who just cares about himself is really quite simple. There is a little math involved, but everybody can understand it. When you try to take into account all the things that Sverker talked about and do that in a rigorous framework, it does get complex. So uh, my question is, you, you, I think you, you showed that there are multiple avenues which mean that if we really care about fairness, relative consumption, is a sort of a, a kind, is a formal, one way of thinking about fairness. Uh, then we should do more for the climate. And there are multiple mechanisms for this. One was the discount rate, another is optimal taxation, another is labor supply. Uh, and there, there are multiple mechanisms. We should actually do more international uh, collaboration, and we should do more for the climate. Yet, what we are observing is somewhat the opposite. We have a breakdown of collaboration. We have a rejection of uh, nonlinear taxation, that is progressive taxation. People vote against the socialist parties and we get uh, less of progressive taxation. We get a, a more unequal world. The last 20, 30 years, the rich are getting much faster richer and we are still rejecting a socialist taxation of these. And we are rejecting international collaboration. And then when there is finally a, a climate policy like fuel taxation, 
Then people pop up and say, oh, this is not fair. But <laughs> there's been a lot of voting against fairness in, in the past. And this is particularly paradoxical in poor countries where gasoline taxes actually are progressive because it's the rich who drive cars. So there's, um, I really think there's a big uh, difference between perceived fairness and real fairness. And, and people uh, use arguments like this is not fair, even in cases when it's not at all true. The lobbies are just way ahead of us. The lobbies that, uh, that drive real politics. Unfortunately, real politics is not listened. The best thing would be if politicians would sit down and listen to people like Olaf and figure out the optimal taxation and public good provision, but that's not the way it's done. Lobbies fool them with arguments that sound good but that are not true. So how do we deal with that? That was a long, uh, long <laughs> question. <laughs> so broadly speaking, um, so as, as a uh, first response, of course, um, all of those models are super simplified, more, almost by definition. Uh, I'm not against super uh, simplified models uh, to the extent that you're learning mechanisms from them. It's not that I think that we are getting the more complex, the more close to the reality are. We are better models. I do think we learn different issues from different models. So I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter of super simplified models, but it's important that we super simplify in the right dimension that we do, do not forget that sometimes we make super strong simplifications other as, uh, uh, in some dimensions and check what's happening when you don't, don't do that. I agree completely about of course, the, the, the description of the world. I, I think more generally that we, and we have to explain that, we have to explain, um, given the world we are in during some constraints, what should we then do and so forth. But I do need that, I do think that we need those uh, simplified optimality frameworks, even though we don't think that governments comple completely work like that and sometimes very far from work like that. Uh, I do think fairness perceptions are, and I've done some work on that myself, of course, and many in this room have done that. Uh, I do think that's very important to measure that separately from some kind of objective measure of inequality and how, how unfair people should think things are and so forth. And, uh, and there are, of course, also in, in the philosophical and uh, literature many, many measures of fairness and dimensions of fairness, how you may define that. Uh, and uh, Stefan, for example, have, have done a lot of work on that recently, different uh, different indicators of fairness and different perceptions of that. And, and that has imp important implications for sure uh, uh, about how things are. Um, and sometimes I, I think we may also in, mod in normative models take into account that people's perception, even though not sort of the, the in some sense right perception of fairness, how that will be affected by policies, maybe that should be part of also the normative framework under some constraint and stuff like that. But, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure it was an answer to maybe to some part of some questions. Yes. So, so, um, so my question will be um, more focused compared to Thomas, so for you to, to be um, a bit narrow-minded. <laughs> but my question is about uh, your con this concept of um, um, uh, relative status in the utility function. And I think it's very close to the concept of aversion inequality, except that uh, when you are averse to inequality, even if you are richer, you care about inequality, well, so you're not happy with inequality compared to in your concept, it's you're happy to be richer. So I was wondering if you can compare the result you have about uh, taxing to mitigate this problem or to t take care of this problem in your framework compared to the one with uh, inequality aversion. Yes, yes. So I can briefly, uh, very, um, since I've done two papers basically with Thomas on also on inequality, measures of inequality aversion, dealing with, for example, Fitch, Peer and Schmidt, versions of inequality aversion, Bolton, Ockenfels, and also other measures dealing, uh, yeah, measures of inequality aversion. And, um, briefly, briefly, I think, um, there you also get externalities. If people care intrinsically about inequality as part of their preferences, uh, if your income are changing, that will affect the measure of inequality, whether it's self-censured directly or whether it's through some global measure, such as Gini coefficient. In, in either way, that would induce externalities. Uh, the, the, the difference here is that the sign of those externalities uh, 
will, will depend typically, it depends on the measure of inequality, but it will typically depend on where you are on the income distribution. So for some measure, you would actually, it would be positive externality if you're poor and get an income increase because you reduce inequality and if, the, and if people dislike inequality, it's good for other people, right? Uh, so if you, for example, have a measure of a Gini coefficient like that, then, then that would be the result. If your poor people increase uh, their income or consumption, that's good for everybody else. That's a positive externality from consumption. Uh, uh, so that then you would get uh, basically an argument for, for subsidizing uh, uh, income or consumption rather than taxing it for those people, whereas you would get similar results for people on, uh, above whatever break-even points where you, where you get zero effects. So that's super brief. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Olof, it's always uh, nice to listen to you. Uh, and I'm very happy and proud to say that you were my supervisor too. Uh, there is something that I've been thinking about that uh, I just want to have your view on that. Uh, we know that in many countries, and especially in developing countries, corruption is a big problem. Uh, so if funds that are supposed to provide a public good is misappropriated, uh, and the, that particular public good is not provided, uh, in my view, there are two types of punishment that, two components of punishment that the individual has to receive. One is the fact that the public good was not provided. So you have denied society uh, the, you know, the opportunity to enjoy the public good. But the other one is that when you steal that money, you put up a house that is bigger than mine. So there is also a positionality, uh, a, a positional externality. So the punishment has to reflect the fact that you deny society the provision of the public good. And second, you are able to build a bigger house than my house because you stole money. So it, the two has to be accounted for when you are assigned, assigning a punishment to uh, someone who steals uh, uh, I mean, public resources. Do you know of any work that has been done uh, to reflect these two types of punishment or punishment with these two components? hard to hear actually through the loudspeakers. So I, I didn't get all of what you said, but, but the, the, I, um, in brief, um, uh, the, the short answer is no, I don't know that. Uh, but I think, um, I think issues of corruption obviously are, are more generally super important and are also important, uh, I think, uh, relative concerns to take into account for, for, for those reasons. But uh, 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 I basically said I didn't get all of what you're saying. I'm super happy to discuss the details in the break. but. Uh, but uh, I, I, guess, I guess the short answer is no. I, I'm not aware of literature dealing with that explicitly anyway. Thanks very much, Olaf. I think we are a bit out of time. So let's wrap up, and then we can take more questions during tea. Thanks very much, everyone.